Welcome to another edition of The Lunchbox with your host, Tim Rain. Today, we're very lucky to have a special guest with us, Don Chapman, who is uh, the, currently the leader of the Lost Canadians. Uh, he is here uh, to uh, do a, a public lecture and screen a documentary film uh, called Lost and Still Not Found, and uh, it's going to take place at 6 p.m. at, at uh, St. Thomas University, and uh, 7 p.m. public lecture will take place Monday, November the 8th. Uh, I don't know if I said that correctly. Did I? Well, yeah, it's going to be at the Noel Kinsella Auditorium for Human Rights. Okay. And uh, that's very significant to, yeah. the, uh, to the lecture because he's been involved in this. Well, this is it. Let's start off with uh, the, the, how you got uh, involved with this uh, our screen, this documentary film, and then we can get into the broader subject as kind of a, as an in row. Okay. Well, you know, the... The beginning was that I lost my Canadian citizenship when I was six and a half years old, and uh, that settled wrong with me. I mean, having citizenship, belonging, being a part of Canada is very precious to me. I mean, we're coming up to Remembrance Day, and we all sit around and stand at the Cenotaph and kind of think back on what it was that got us here as Canadians in the first place. Well, my family was no different. They were, uh, my dad was in the military in World War II, but he took out U.S. citizenship. And under the old laws, and they were written in 1868, this is the exact wording, married women, minors, lunatics, and idiots will be classified under the same disability for their national status. And that law remained on the books for 79 years. Wow. And, and then Canada adopted their first form of uh, actual Canadian identity called the uh, Canadian Citizenship Act of 1947, and while married women could now be Canadian citizens, they didn't have the same rights as men, specific to do with passing citizenship. But minors, lunatics, and idiots remained under the same disability for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then in 1977, they adopted their next form of citizenship, the 1977 Citizenship Act, and while they were a great deal more inclusive at that point, the problem was they didn't make it retroactive, so they had, if they had disenfranchised you, as they did with me, yeah. you remained disenfranchised. Why wouldn't they make it re uh, retroactive? That, that's strange to me. Yeah, it's very strange. They should have learned their lesson. Uh, back in 1793, Canada did this when they abolished slavery. Yeah. And they said, if anybody's a slave, you'll remain a slave till you die, but anybody new can't be. So if you had given uh, birth to a child, your child would be free, you would not. Mm. That's not the way to abolish something. Uh, no, especially absolutely. Especially human rights. I mean, um, could you imagine, quite seriously, if they had done that in the United States, the way they brought equality of rights uh, in the civil rights movement in the 1960s? Right. There's still a lot of people still alive. That's now, right. They would still technically... They would still yeah. have the black and white drinking fountain. Right. Today. Right. Any uh, Their kids did, wouldn't have to drink out of, you know, they could, they'd have their free choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd still have segregated movie theaters. And I mean, that's the wrong way to do it. Right. And that's what Canada did in Citizenship Act in 1977. So what I'm trying to do is correct these old, old archaic laws that go back 143 years uh, that to completely take away the chattel aspect where people were considered property and then to kind of make Canada more inclusive to their own people of all groups, uh, so that these divisions of the 1947 Act, the 77 Act, become one, and we can finally get on with accepting our own people. Let me ask you, why Why do you think something that is important as this uh, has been so ignored by the government? Uh, there, there, obviously, there's political uh, uh, reasons, but at the same time, it seems, is it just stuck within a bureaucratic red tape? What, what's, what's happening? No, no, there's a lack of a political will to do something. Now, I, I've got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, right here in New Brunswick, the, uh, one of the people that helped us in the very beginning was Senator Noel Kinsella, uh, and then Senator Donald, Donald Oliver over in the, uh, in, from Nova Scotia. And it was our third bill going through Parliament. The first two had failed. Uh, uh, and, and finally, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to change that. I think it was the third bill uh, uh, that had uh, three had failed. Now we were going for our fourth, sponsored by Senator Noel Kinsella. This was his bill, and it was mm -hmm. Bill S-2. And it passed, but 
There were 12 ways, as it turned out, 12 different categories of lost Canadians where you could be stripped of citizenship. Senator Kinsella's bill only allowed one group, and it allowed only that group. In other words, I, w I was in that first group. These right. were minor minors when maybe your, your responsible parent, in my case my Canadian father, took out U.S. citizenship and Canada ripped up my citizenship. So it allowed me to come back. There are 85,000 people like me. Wow. But it didn't allow me to bring my children. Mm. So there were deficiencies in the bill. Uh, at the time, Senator Kinsella said, we'll work on this one group at a time. We'll never get them all if we uh, you know, try to get everybody. And we were up against the liberals at the time. The liberals were not supporting this, which kind of is ironic because the founder, if you will, of Canadian citizenship was Paul Martin Sr. At the time, Paul Martin Jr., his son, was the Prime Minister of Canada going around espousing equality of rights, but he wouldn't do it in citizenship law. Mm. So we put a private member's bill through Senator Kinsella into the Senate. We passed it, uh, or got it passed unanimously right away. It went into uh, the House of Parliament where Paul Martin now finds himself in, in a bit of a quandary in that now he has every one of his senators unanimously saying, this is good, let's pass it, his liberal senators. Right. If he ignores them in the House, he looks really stupid. Right. Because right. now he's ignoring his own senators. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and being especially, it was unanimous. So the bill ended up passing unanimously in the House, but again, not without a major fight. At that stage, Senator Kinsella appeared to me a little bit to check out. Because while we were dealing with the one group, we still had 11 other groups to try to rectify the, the wrong. And since then, that was in 2005, Senator Kinsella has met with me, but I don't know. He, maybe he's done something. If he has, he has not communicated that with me. Right. I would like to get more legislation through because now the villain, if you will, are not the liberals. Yeah. It's a conservative. That's right. Yeah. Now, for the conservatives' credit, they came back and worked with me in that uh, for the next three years, 2006, seven, and eight, and we got Bill C-37 passed. Now, Bill C-37 really, really did change a lot of laws. Every Canadian on the planet was affected by these laws. Hmm. Maybe you could explain to our audience what, how they would have been affected. It changed their rights. That's right. Oh, in what context? So maybe. It actually, in some ways, took some rights away from you. So wow. today, we have people that are becoming the, the Canadians, and they've been Canadian all their life, and they have a child born overseas, and the child is stateless.